And we continue our work session and we uh, invite Luke Michael Ironside, Theosophical Society of England, Director of the Virtual Centre for Theosophical Studies, Great Britain, London. Uh, Luke Michael Ironside was born in the UK, studied media and communication in the Unitech Institute of Technology in New Zealand and taught English at the London Teachers College in the UK. Theoso in the UK. Theoso a lecturer and writer, member of the Theosophical Society IGA, member of the group based in Halkion, California. He regularly lectured in the national headquarters in the Philippines and the UK. His articles have been published in various theosophical journalists journals pardon around the world. Previously, Luke Michael Ironside was the president of Pranava Lodge at the Theosophical Society in the Philippines, and right now he is the editor of the journal The Theosophical Vector, published in the International Theosophical Publishing House Albatros, currently the Virtual Center for Theosophical Studies at ER. Ironside, Theosophical Society of England, with his report, The Unity of Life. Thank you, and uh, I extend my greetings to all attendees who are with us today. I'm most thankful to have been invited to speak at this International Theosophical Congress. And while I regret I was unable to attend in person, I'm very happy to be joining you all virtually here today. I chose the topic, the unity of life, because I think if we were to encapsulate the theosophical worldview in a single word, that word would be unity. Unity is at the heart of the theosophical perspective of life. Unity is the central, the central theme of all theosophical inquiry, and it is the, the central idea of Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. So I'd like to open with a quote from the secret doctrine to quote the first fundamental proposition as put forth in the poem. The one absolute reality which antedates all manifested conditioned being, which Madame Bavatsky states is an omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle on which all speculation is impossible, since it transcends the power of human conception. And so this being the central idea or the first fundamental principle of the secret doctrine and of theosophical inquiry, we can see quite how significant this is and how this is the unifying principle which underlies all other concepts and underlies all other aspects of the theosophical worldview. So arriving at a proper understanding of this first fundamental proposition is imperative. And this is the absolute, the one reality, often referred to in Western philosophy by the term first cause, and yet better understood from the theosophical conception by the term causeless cause, that which is infinite, unmanifested, and unmanifestable, whilst yet the source from which all else springs forth. Whilst the universe is pervaded by the duality of apparent forms, the opposite poles of subject and object, spirit, and matter are merely aspects of the fundamental unity which underlies them. The absolute itself is neither manifested nor manifestable. It is alone infinite and eternal, the universal form being but a passing appearance or maya, to use the Sanskrit term. And so this first fundamental proposition asserts the unity and oneness of all life. It suggests an original 
homogeneous source from which the differentiations of substance come into existence. The one manifests as the many, and from here arises the multiplicity of forms in nature and the diversity of cosmic life. And I think that's really fascinating to consider the, the incredible and rich diversity of the world, this, this ever-expanding diversity. And the more that science studies the world, the greater this diversity seems to come. The more that science explores the universe, both on a microcosmic level and also on a macrocosmic level, the more we're discovering how diverse life actually is. And so our awareness of the diversity of life is constantly expanding. It's constantly growing and expanding to include new forms of life, new, new forms of existence. And yet being rooted in this awareness that we receive from our theosophical studies, that this grand diversity of life is all from this one original source makes this expanding realization all the more powerful and all the more amazing to consider. And following on in the secret doctrine, we have the statement that the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root. And so this diversity in unity expands and includes the identity of the soul, the idea that the diversities of the diversity of souls in existence are likewise unified, that there is a single universal oversoul at the root of all existence. And therefore, all existence is one at the most fundamental level. Differences and separations are only apparent and have no true basis in reality. Whilst in the midst of constant changes and fluctuations of daily life, this fact is an easy one to forget. The truth of unity remains ever existent before the surface. A single thread running throughout the variety of forms. The task of the theosophist is to seek the one in the many. And it is this task to seek the one in the many that we find ourselves called to in living the theosophic life, to recognize uh, the fundamental identity of ourselves with all of life, and therefore, which would lead us naturally to an altruistic, charitable, and compassionate perspective towards all forms of life, both human and non-human. So I think it's very interesting how the, firstly, the intellectual realization of the unity of life, later the spiritual realization of the unity of life leads to practical results. I think it's impossible to truly recognize the, the truth of the the unity of, of existence without being in some way fundamentally changed by this and to change in one's perspective and also in one's behavior towards one's environment and the world at large. So when we recognize this truth of unity, we change in the ways that we interact with other people. We change in the ways that we do business. We are less competitive. We change in the ways that we interact with strangers, with people we don't know on a personal level. We are fundamentally changed in the way that we interact with the world, which is why we have such axioms as the hermetic axiom, as above, so below, so within, so without. It's this idea that a change on one level 
causes a change on another level. So an inner change impacts the world. And by developing ourselves, by this process of self-transformation, which takes place as we arrive into a deeper recognition of the unity of life, we better the world at large. We create a better world. And so our daily experiences tend to reinforce the sense of separateness, which pervades our outlook on life. The forms of life which surround us differ greatly from our own. And our tendency of thought is to focus on the differences, on our sense of individuality. And as such, we too often fail to recognize the unifying source that binds us together as one. Which is why in theosophical study and in the study of, of Vedic literature, we find such ideas as Maya as contrasted with Parabrahman or reality. The idea that this illusion surrounds us. This illusion is all pervading. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of perceiving the shadows on the wall of the cave as reality. And that's the, the, the purpose and necessity of discrimination in spiritual thought, to be able to distinguish between the real and the unreal, the shadows on the cave and the, the, the world itself as it is. Yet we each of us also experience fleeting moments of unity where our focus of identification shifts from the personal self to that of the universal. This is the mystic experience referred to in the writings of the mystics of all ages and religious persuasions, most often captured in poetry, song, and art, for the fact of its experience transcend transcending the limits of words. Looking beyond the tapestry of forms, the seeker may yet behold the unity beneath, the essence of the one. And so that's the interesting thing about the limitation of language. It's so often incapable of capturing reality in words, which is why we find that many mystics resort to things like poetry and art and music and, and other forms of expression. Reality transcends all of these forms naturally. It, it transcends any attempt to encapsulate it or to limit it. And yet sometimes these forms are somewhat closer to an expression of reality than the huge limitations of, of language. And so we have established that underlying the world of form and of change and of daily experience, there must be a one reality, the essence of life and being, which transcends both mind and matter. To speculate further upon this ultimate principle is impossible, as it surpasses the reaches of finite speculation. In the words of the philosopher Spinoza, to define God is to deny him. The only statement that can be made regarding the nature of the absolute is that it is. I think it's another fascinating paradox in the theosophical inquiry that the ultimate reality, which we are called to arrive at an awareness of that we are called to recognize and understand is essentially unknowable in our present state of evolution. So it's a, it's a fascinating paradox that requires much reflection. Everything in the universe is alive. There is no dead matter in truth. The entire cosmic play is an emanation of the absolute as expressed in the universal life, by which is brought into form the countless varieties of life and activity in the phenomenal world. Even in the world of inorganic things, 
is manifested that one underlying life. In every atom and particle may be found its animating spark. The active principle of this universal life is the creative will, which is forever at work in the creation and building up of new forms, shapes, and combinations, and the subsequent tearing down of such for the purposes of recycling the material for use in new combinations of form. And we know from theosophical study that there is no reality to death. There is only the changing of forms, the shifting and changing and evolving from one shape to another. And that's what's taking place in this, this great process of the creative will. And the creative will thus has a threefold function, that of creator, preserver, and destroyer. The change is taking place, however, being merely in the reorganization of forms the fundamental substance remaining ever the same, the change being but an outward appearance. The universal life is a great ocean of being, the depths of which remain ever still and undisturbed, the real essence of which is unmoved by the chaos of the crashing waves and billows that break upon the shore, the constant play of the creative will upon the surface of life. The one universal life is thus the grand manifestation of the absolute, in which the variety and multiplicity of forms are centers of consciousness, each expressing some unique aspect of the one life, whilst remaining vitally connected with all other such centers of energy or consciousness by the bond of unity underlying each and all. This idea is fundamental to arriving at an understanding of theosophy and must be taken as the proposition upon which the edifice of theosophic thought is built. Without such unity, all would be chaos. Correlations between things would be but a fiction, and law, order, science, and cosmos would be as shadows in the dusk of the chaotic night. That all life is one, that all forms of manifestation exist in harmonious unity with one another, that all diversity is but apparent and must fade before the torch of truth, this is the great teaching of theosophy, from which the well of wisdom springs forth. It is the tendency of the human intellect to report that life, in its many forms, is characterized by variety and separation, that there can be no unity amid such diversity, and that such a concept would be opposed to the facts of nature. Yet from the higher reaches of the mind is revealed the knowledge of an underlying oneness that, in spite of the appearance of duality and diversity, affirms the deeper truth of our connection to the one. Thus do we become aware of the illusion of separateness, the working fiction of the universe, which veils the fact of unity at the heart of our existence. Arriving at a consciousness of this unity is something that must be experienced before its truth can be properly realized. Intellectual speculation can only bring the seeker so far. The remainder of the path must be walked along the experiential road. This cosmic knowing is not always an immediate acquirement. For many, it is a gradual process whereby the seeker unfolds progressively into an awareness of the oneness of all life and the fact of one's being a center of consciousness by which the universal life is made manifest. The seeker, therefore, recognized themselves as a center, a sun around which the whirling planets revolve, and it is only then that they may arrive at the fuller conception of the one life. 
And it's for this reason that it's emphasized that the study of the secret doctrine and the general walking of the theosophical path is a truly experiential experience. It's not something which can be simply studied on the intellectual level. It's something which must be lived and experienced. It's a transformative experience. This shifting conception of the place of the human being in the grand scheme of cosmic existence is fueled by a realization in the hearts of those so ill-immune as to the changing of the tides of human interaction. We have thus far found ourselves tied as a species to the vicious cycles of incessant violence and conflict. And yet, in turning one's gaze toward the horizon of the future, man perceives a bright beacon of hope upon the mountain peak of the coming age. A turning away from the primitivism of ages past in the light of a grander and nobler unfoldment of consciousness. Unity is the war cry of our current age. With each rising, man looks anew upon the circumstances of his life, and failing to perceive the underlying order beneath the seeming chaos, finds himself standing at a crossroads, between a new dawn or a fateful and final slide into the gaping chasm of despond. It is into this scene that we must emerge as students of the ageless wisdom, to carry forth the banner of brotherhood into the world. In facing the tides of darkness, the Theosophist conquers by the light of love and service. The Theosophist charges joyously into the fray, ever willing to stand up for the cause of unity. Such is the Theosophic life, the practical promulgation of unity by the means of faithful service. The realization of the oneness of life thus brings us at the last to a shift in our conscious outlook on life. No longer can we turn from the injustices and terrors of our world, the conflicts and struggles that so afflict our current age. We must each play a part in the creation of a better world built upon the foundation of brotherhood in whatever capacity that role may be. Theosophy offers us the means whereby we may fulfill such a role by shedding a light upon the often darkened path to reveal in part the road ahead. All that falls to us is to continue along the way through thickets and thorns, break and brier, to the sunlight clearing that lies beyond the tangled path. Here we may bask in the light of unity, brothers and sisters all, united in common cause for the building of a world founded on the ideals of justice, cooperation, and peace. Thank you very much. Господин Айрансайд, благодарим вас за дерзновение. Justice, cooperation, and peace, the practice of every day. Let, thank you for the inspired appeal, which is so necessary on such a day and uh, in such a year, in 190th year since birth of HPB. Thank you so much. <laughs>